This episode of Genre Vision is brought to you by our premium subscribers at patreon.com slash genre vision. If you become a premium subscriber for just five bucks a month, you can get access to all of the bonus material we make for the Genre Vision network of shows. That includes Genre Vision, Finflix, Third Time's the Charm, and additional material that we make exclusive for Patreon. Greetings, loyal listeners and new recruits. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. And this is Genre Vision. Every week, Travis and I review and recommend horror films, action movies, fantasy flicks, sci-fi cinema, and more. And we're continuing Childhood Nightmares Month with The Brave Little Toaster. Uh, before we do that, just a quick call to action. And we've said it recently, but its I think we're just going to have to keep saying it uh, until... <laughs> Until morale improves. We demand results. <laughs> we want to be educated. Uh, we really, really cannot overstate our need of reviews on the Apple Podcast Store right now. Incoming reviews and the number of them directly affect our rankings in the Apple Podcast charts. The higher we are in the charts, the more discoverable we are. For the podcast to continue to grow, these reviews are absolutely necessary. So if you enjoy the show and you've not left a review on the Apple Podcast Store... Please get on your PC or your Mac or your iPad or your iPhone, head to the Apple Podcast Store, search for Genre Vision, and leave us a star rating and a brief review. We promise we'll read it on the show. We just got a review from loyal listener Tim Langford. Uh, Tim calls the show intellectually stimulating and magnetically friendly. Five stars. He also says, as a movie buff without as many movie buff friends as I'd like, I can always count on Drew and Travis to have the type of discussion that I wish I could have in person with equal parts opinion and analysis, humor and gravity. Tim, thank you so much. And to everybody else, thank you so much for listening. And please be like Tim. All right. The Brave Little Toaster, as I said, continues Childhood Nightmares we, uh, Month, rather. And this is a, a, a personal one for me because this is certainly, uh, unlike the peanut butter solution, which... Last week, Travis had seen that as a kid, but it was such a vague memory for you that it it was a total first watch, essentially, when we did it. Yeah. Now, I had vague memories of Brave Little Toaster as well. Like, I, I'd grown up watching this, but watching it again, my memory turns out my memory of it was a lot more solid uh, than I had, you know, given myself credit for. Okay. I mean, for, for me, this was recorded on, you know, some VHS that had like four, you know, three or four other movies that were also on it and was kind of part of my just movie watching cycle when I was a very, very, very young kid. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking like four and younger. So I have extremely deeply ingrained memories about this movie and had revisited, uh, revisited it a number of times throughout my life. Uh, but it'd been a couple of years since I'd watched it. Uh, since, since we decided to do it for this, the childhood nightmares month and the brave little toaster. I have always argued it's worth arguing for it as a horror movie for kids. And I, I, I'm a little malleable to that position after this watch, but I still think even from the get go, the Brave Little Toaster sets up a mood and a tone that is directly attempting to be eerie and off-putting. Yeah, the opening is really, really haunting. It actually reminds me a little bit of the opening of the movie from 2000 starring Nicole Kidman called The Others. Mm. You know, it takes place in this very secluded, fog-bound English manner. And there's the, this similar kind of haunted, foggy feeling at the beginning of this movie where we see some, you know, sort of hilly, foresty landscapes, and they're all kind of blanketed in dense fog. And the score is not this really upbeat thing. The score was uh, composed by David Newman for this movie. And it's this very kind of tentative introduction, a little creepy, you know, it's like, what's, what's going on here? Like, why am I not being introduced to a bright, sunny world? Like I would expect in a children's animated musical film. Yes. It, it, it starts off. This is just before dawn. And so it's still nighttime and you're saying it's foggy or we're coming in and we see this abandoned house and we enter the house. And as the credits are going, there's some really wonderful kind of abstract images at first, like streaks of light on a floor that are, that just look like just straight lines at first until we realize that they're, they're coming from, you know, like a crack in the door, or the window. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the, like you say, the, the David Newman score, which I think is very good throughout the movie. Sure. Yeah. Is setting this tone of like, this is 
kind of creepy and it's like we're it's like we're being introduced to a haunted house and the movie seems to be kind of cognizant of that atmosphere that this is an empty house you know no human souls still live in the home it's only the appliances that come to life when you're not looking and the, and the the first appliance that comes to life is the radio voiced by John Lovitz it should be said that i think the voice cast for this movie is is pretty on point um good performances and and John Lovitz I think is actually doing really good work here. He's got a lot of funny lines, uh you know, how how much of that was improvised or was actually written, I don't know, but uh, considering I think the only other John Lovitz vehicle we've ever covered on this show was Mom and Dad Save the World. Uh <laughs> God, really? Is it the only Lovitz thing we've talked about? I, I think it might be. Oh um, God. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, don't, don't expect John Lovitz month any, any time in the near future listeners. But uh, I actually think Lovitz is really good here. He's supposed to be annoying, but endearing at times. And, and this is something that we'll track as we meet the rest of the appliances. One is a lamp named Lampy. Uh, the, vacuum is called Kirby. The blanket is just called blanket or blankie. And then toaster, uh, the titular toaster is just called toaster. These, these appliances just are named what they are. Kirby, I'm, I'm assuming is obviously a, a vacuum joke, a, a brand sure. joke. Yeah. Something like that. But, uh, we get the sense that, you know, these, uh, Appliances are preparing for somebody to come home. Uh, there is a moment where they're having some sort of argument. Like the, it's clear that these appliances don't get along very well, but they all have one thing in common, and that's keeping the house ready for Master to come home. In the middle of this discussion, Blanket gets this like far away look on its little ugly face. It's an electric blanket, so it has a little dial uh, to turn the heat up and down. But that's its like nose and face. It gets this far away look in its eyes, and it's like car. I hear a car. So they put they put it up into the window at the front of the attic to see if it can spot a distant car and uh, drives by and just leaves them. This is after the cleaning montage set to Tutti Frutti by Little Richard uh, t- towards the end, of which we're going to talk about music in a little bit. And I think it's important to establish that that that's the first song we hear, which is playing on the radio. But then, yes, the blanket sees a car. Everybody all the appliances freak out they start building a tower the blanket is looking out the window and they're asking like is it him is it the master and we see from the blanket's perspective this car coming down the hills and then it morphs and turns watery and turns into a different looking car and all of a sudden the scenery the color palette brightens up and, well it all goes like dr seuss like all the trees change shape and it's like oh the fucking truffula trees popped out so yes. and <laughs> we're we're getting inside the head of a blanket um there we are um, a, a blanket that is now obsessed with its child coming home. And so we see this fantasy sequence of the master coming home and the blanket is floating down the stairs toward the master. Like it's in fucking <laughs> poltergeist and, it, and master reaches out his hand. Oh, blankie, I missed you. I love you. And then they're snapped out of that fantasy <laughs> very rudely. Well, for, first of all, uh, that, that moment where the blanket levitates up and floats down the staircase and all of a sudden the house is you know, like the, the, the staircase rail is solid gold and everything's glittering and, and the blanket with its, its wide eyes just going, the master. Uh, so it's, creepy. It's so surreal and creepy and odd. But the right before it's able to touch its blanket hand uh with the master it stops and then a car zooms through the middle of the frame and basically uh the transition makes it look look like you know leaves that have been disturbed and floating around it's a great transition and incredibly an, a, an effective example of how to use the art form of animation to do things that at least at the time would be something that you would have to do through an optical effect or process to make this kind of transition. It is literally and emotionally a cutting moment where we have now learned, ah, okay, the appliances long for this master who was apparently a child. They have been living in the house that seems to be getting decrepit. and Yeah, well, I mean, they, they do their best to keep it up, but this movie does not drop you in with a whole bunch of factual exposition 
it lets you get used to what these characters are like interacting with one another. And it doesn't tell you exactly the circumstances of what's going on. It lets you infer certain things, but the weird reveal as to like what has been going on at this house while the master is not away doesn't happen until the third act. And when it does, it makes everything way creepier. (laughs) Yes, uh, it um, absolutely does. They decide eventually that like they've had, enough uh, of you know waiting for the master and like keeping the house uh uh keeping the house up to to snuff and uh, they all decide to 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 get out of there and the thing that really makes their decision uh for them is the the window shaker air conditioner voiced by phil hartman goes fucking crazy and breaks down i was gonna say that this is childhood nightmares month and the brave little toaster is kind of a litany of childhood nightmare moments. And I think the the first one, there, there's all this, you know, creepy setup that we had is there. It's like weirdly moody so far. But this, yes, this this moment with the air conditioner is like, whoa, this is okay. the first real like you're going to remember this kid. This will burn itself onto your brain is Phil Hartman doing a Jack Nicholson impersonation as this air conditioner gets angry at the appliances because they say, you know, that you're just crotchety because the master didn't play with you and the the air conditioner goes on this you know he's like so it's back to that old static again is it that's pretty good drew uh thank you um and he's he's talking about how it's a conspiracy how all the appliances are against him he starts freaking out he says stuff you know it's not my fault the kid wasn't tall enough to touch my knobs which is like by the way, like th- this character's perspective is like impenetrable to a child. Like, what is this character talking about? Well, he also says the uh, or, uh, no, no, I, I believe it's another one of the characters. No, no, no. It is the air conditioner because Kirby, the vacuum, says something to him uh, in argument. And the air conditioner says, what are you going to do? Suck me to death? Yeah. What? Uh, <laughs> which is like, excuse Whoa. me. I guess this is a good enough point. Uh, you know, I'll say this shortly um, after we finish this moment, but the air conditioner freaks out. He burns up, essentially Fritz is out and and it's kind of like he accidentally killed himself. Yeah. He starts spewing sparks everywhere. It's, it's oddly grotesque, um, which, you know, grotesquery is something that this movie does curiously well. Um, notice how we have not talked a lot about the toaster itself. That's because we're 15 minutes into the movie and thus far, The movie really hasn't made any kind of argument for the toaster as a, not even a protagonist, but a perspective character. Like, we haven't had a lot of stuff from the toaster's perspective. Yeah, I was going to say that in the beginning, the toaster is pretty much his only role in this opening segment, is to get everybody on board with doing chores. Yeah. He's the one that bandies them all. It's like, hey, you know, let's make a game out of it. Let's do this, that, and the other. Do they use, do they use male pronouns for the toaster? Um, I can't remember I exactly if they do or not. Um, I don't know, but I, I mean, do know that the toaster's voiced by a woman. It's Deanna Oliver, who oddly enough is one of the credited screenwriters on the Casper movie from 95. Hmm. Well, uh, so something else before we get into the, the toaster protagonist issue, I do want to mention is that this movie, when we talk about all the weird stuff that it's going to do, I think it's fascinating because most people will probably think of the brave old toaster as a Disney movie. It's not, it was, it was not produced by Disney. They, I believe only, uh, had a hand in the home video, uh, distribution of it. Well, Disney studios bought the rights to the novella that this is based on. It's written by a guy named Thomas dish. Um, they bought the rights in 82. And then John Lasseter, who we now know as the the now canceled uh, serial sexual harasser from from Pixar, uh, they had done um, a combination 2D, 3D test animation for Where the Wild Things Are, and they wanted to apply the same technique to their production of Brave Little Toaster. And Lasseter pitched this to the Disney execs, and it turns out it was way too expensive. So Disney said, okay, well, we can hand this off to another company. Um, and they can actually be the one to produce it. It was produced by a company called Hyperion Pictures, um, which I believe was some ex-Disney employees. Uh, it was, yeah, it looks like Tom Wilhite and Willard Carroll. Well, it was, it was a lot of CalArts students yeah. uh, who, who would eventually go on to be involved with Pixar. So um, Hyperion Pictures made this 
and I, I'm not sure if they made it with theatrical exhibition in mind. Um, this, I, I do believe had some theatrical extra, uh, exhibition, mm-hmm. but, um, was primarily intended for home video. Like I, the, the copy we saw was obviously in full screen. I don't know if this was actually animated in 16 by nine widescreen intended for a theatrical distribution at all. Well, from what I could look up is that one thirty three one was the, uh, I believe I can't remember that I'm probably gonna get these flipped around. That was the intended ratio. Okay. And that's, that's I, full screen. That's four by three. Yes. Um, but I believe that it was, you know, animated in one seventy eight one. Hmm. Okay. So the version that we saw pro- probably had some edges of the frame missing. Sounds like, well, I believe that it was intentional to have that happens a lot in animation. Yeah where they will, you know, shoot bigger because they know it's going to get cropped down. And that's why there will be some when, you know, they do these widescreen remasters or things of show, if they can actually go to the source material, it's like, well, actually, you're seeing stuff on in the cell that was not supposed to be seen. Got it. So um, a lot of the animators on this weren't just folks at Hyperion. Um, while Hyperion was the, the production company that managed the production, many of the animators were Taiwanese. If you look through the credits of this movie, many, many, many Chinese names. It turns out they're all from Taiwan. Yes, and and this is a a very common practice in a lot of uh, children's television animation, and just yeah. and just television animation in general. Yeah, and the animation in the Brave Little Toaster, while it's it's certainly not bad, it's not up to the kind of standards of quality that we were seeing from Walt Disney feature animation at the time. Oh, by no means. So this is closer to a TV quality animation. I have deep affection for this movie, but I will be the first one to say that the animation is spotty. You can kind of, as many times as I've seen this movie, I can spot, it's like, okay, this is where this particular, you know, whatever group of animators worked on this sequence, like they were like, put the money into that. Like, because there's early on when the blanket sees the car uh, for the first time and the toaster is telling everyone to be quiet. They do this rack focus to where like, okay, there's animated stuff in the background, but clearly there is a cell that was nothing. It was a clear cell with just the blanket and the toaster. Mm. And when they do that rack focus, it's like, Ooh, they don't, they're not layered on the background at all. It looks really bad. Um, So, and there's, there's stuff like that throughout the movie where you can kind of see they, they, they chose their battles with that stuff. They did. I mean, there are some really nice painted backgrounds for the the wilderness stuff. You know, the opening of the film is really kind of moody and beautiful. Like they knew they had to spend their money in certain places. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I think we and we'll they'll, we'll certainly get to that as we get to the more nightmarish stuff. Uh, but yes, the the appliances head off to the city to find the master. And we get our first proper song, which is City of Light, which I guess this is as good a time as any to say that there are four original songs in this movie uh they are written by van dyke parks and city of lights probably it's probably the most accessible and the best song as utilized in the movie and it's the song that's the closest to what you would expect from what most people would probably assume is a disney animated musical right it's a traveling montage song so it's got a good brisk pace to it but it's also pulling double duty like it's not just a traveling song like it's it's there to reestablish motivation for the characters as well because the characters you know in sort of defiance of traditional movie musical format they don't get an i want song and an I Want song, you know, in the first act is typically a, a protagonist thing, but the movie hasn't really chosen a protagonist. It's an ensemble piece in, in the first act, at least. And then there's usually a Welcome to Our World song, which instead of doing that sort of thing, like instead of introducing like, this is our world, this is our routine, we live here, we do this. Instead, that's done with a, a Tutti Frutti, <laughs> the Little yes, Richard the, song. The radio plays Tutti Frutti and they're all cleaning up. It's like, okay, I guess we get the idea that this is a relatively normal day-to-day thing for them. Yeah. So you the, watching the first, what, 25 minutes of the movie, you wouldn't think it was a musical until the musical suddenly starts like 25 minutes in and you're like, oh, okay. Well, that's what I mean for the only having four original songs. It's like, yeah, that's, that's pretty small, especially when you compare it to the Disney Renaissance that was going to be happening, uh, you know, a- after this time. Um, it, it's, it's not structured because those movies in the late eighties and throughout the nineties structured themselves like Broadway musicals of the time. Yes. And, and that is not the case with Brave Little Toaster. The songs 
really are kind of singular entities. And it's why I kind of recommend listening to the song. Like if you've seen the movie, listening to the songs separately um, from the soundtrack, because they work a lot better on their own. But like I say, City of Light, it's a good song. It's it's the catchiest song, um, I think, by design. Yeah. And if you don't know who Van Dyke Parks is, he's the guy that did a lot of the orchestration on Beach Boys, um, Pet Sounds and Smile. Mm-hmm. So he has this distinct sense of psychedelia. Like I first got into Van Dyke Parks when I discovered the album Diorama by Silverchair, which is this huge orchestral rock album yeah. with amazing orchestration. And I was like, oh, right. Okay. I need to go back and listen to Pet Sounds. Um because I, I used to like the early Beach, the Beach Boys stuff, but um, kind of found their their orchestral stuff a little bit more impenetrable. Um, of course, Good Vibrations is, is incredible. Um, and Van Dyke Parks had a big hand in that. But, you know, Van Dyke Parks wasn't the kind of Broadway composer. I mean, this is a guy that used to smoke a lot of weed and do a lot of drugs with Brian Wilson. I mean, the, yeah. The, and the songs reflect a very specific viewpoint and, and weirdness. Um and we'll get to them because the the there's one song that I think is just I can't believe it's in the movie. Yeah. Um but so so the the appliances have some adventures in the forest. There's some fun moments. Uh there's a very inch because, because here here's my big issue with the movie that I view it now as an adult. This movie isn't so much a narrative as it is a series of vignettes. Yeah, like the first big vignette we get is a whole Busby Berkeley uh, montage of like, or a, an, an homage to the Busby Berkeley choreography movies. Yes, where the bunch of forest animals and suddenly it turns into like a cutesy Disney TV show for, for about 10 minutes. Right. And then I said to you, like when we were watching it, I was like, the movie's just dicking around at this point. Like there's no forward motion. All we're getting is like synchronized swimming with a whole bunch of frogs. Uh, and then there's, there's this really funny cut to the toaster while it's watching all this stuff. And it's just this <laughs> very unimpressed face while the frogs are like, you know, mugging for the camera basically. But in this moment is, is a moment that I, that has always stuck with me as a kid. And it's something that I just, I, I get it. I think now in the, the arc of the toaster in this movie, uh, in that the toaster's running away from all these animals that are messing with it. And it runs into this little clearing and there's a single little flower and the flower is alive in some way. And it sees a reflection of itself in the toaster and thinks that it's another flower and it it starts to like rub itself up on the toaster and hug the toaster thinking it's another flower and the toaster says no 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 i'm i'm not a flower it's just a reflection and then the flower hugs it even tighter so the toaster gets scared and runs away and it looks back and when it looks back at the flower the flower has wilted and begun to die yeah it's it's a weird moment that thematically is a little opaque particularly for a kid's movie. Well, especially for a kid's movie, I should say. I, well, the, the thing is, and I think this is a, a, something I can only have gauged over seeing this movie multiple times more over my life. And I don't think the movie communicates this very well, but the characters are all dicks, like from the beginning, particularly it's, to each other. There's a sequence where they're going through like a, a field of like brambles and thorns and they, it gets to a point where it's too dark and they can't continue on. So they're trying to fall asleep and the blanket tries to snuggle with the toaster and the toaster is pretty much like, fuck off, get out of here. Nobody wants your creepy ass. Well, no, the blanket tries to snuggle with everybody and they all give him some, you know, just like, hey, get away from me. You're get it. Ugh, piss off, you creepy little shit. Yeah. Well, he goes to the toaster last and we're like, oh, yeah, the toaster will let him snuggle because the toaster's nice. And the toaster says, like, get out of here. I'm not the master. Go snuggle somewhere else. And it's like, oh, even the toaster's an asshole and then afterwards this moment with the flower happens and shortly after that the toaster begins trying to be nicer to blanket yeah it's like okay so there's something happening here but again it's it's not directly communicating itself in a way that the majority of children's entertainment needs to be more direct about right we need to understand in the moment that it's composing a metaphor and that the flower is blanket the closest thing we get in that moment is that the flower is the same color as blanket mm-hmm. so you know that's i think as a kid that would a lot i think that would go all over a lot of kids heads because like the, is there a huge moral message in this movie absolutely not it's like thematically well, almost like devoid of that kind of stuff it's barely a moral tale the morality we can get to which i don't think is a 
it's a morality that clicks perfectly with Disney. But um, so they have some forest adventures. There's a whole big section with a waterfall The I, I appreciate the movie continuously putting these characters in genuinely scary peril for them. Yeah, like even when they're not actually actively involved in peril that is pushing them forward towards their eventual destination, the characters are literally having like fantasies and nightmares. Um, Like when they're stuck in the (laughs) woods, for instance, uh, there's a huge storm and there's a fucking uh, nightmare sequence for the toaster. It's like the first big perspective moment we have for the toaster. Yes, appliances dream. Uh, This is a section of electric sheep. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and I mean, this is a the literal nightmare section of the childhood nightmares. And this is I, I this is a the, we'll get to the song later. But this is a moment I cannot believe is in the movie. But I kind of can because it's not under the auspices of Disney. Something like this would never have been in a Disney film from the era, or certainly afterwards, in which the toaster has this dream of. The master, you know, he's making toast for the master and everything's happy. But then all of a sudden smoke starts billowing out of the top, the, the top of the toaster's head. And the smoke turns into this giant hand that grabs the master and pulls him away from the toaster. Okay, it's like it's like something out of Poltergeist. Well, and then this thing goes full on Pennywise, which I have to believe, you know, this is after it was published and was an enormously successful book and the kind of scary clown idea really re-entered pop culture in this moment a demonic firefighter clown rises up from the bottom of the frame it doesn't just have like clown hair by the way it has literally like two huge demon horns sticking out of the side of its head and these big long yellow teeth and it rises towering up over the toaster and the toaster looks up at it and the clown leans down with its big yellow teeth and gets right up close and goes run and little bits of smoke poof out between its teeth and it's like what the fuck is this movie doing this is this is scarring yeah like, I'm, it's seared in my brain from childhood yes and then the nightmare continues in which like if that wasn't enough the demon clown turns on a fire hose and sprays water out as the toaster's running away and then the water turns into a wave of forks yeah and the forks are all raining down you know uh, around the toaster while it's trying to escape uh, and then the toaster eventually wakes up to find that it's storming outside. Well, no, uh, I mean, you get the, the toaster dies in his dream. He does. he? Wow. Yes. He after these the raining forks, he then has that dream shift moment where all of a sudden he's hanging off of the uh, 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 shower railing. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to fall into the bathtub. Right. And he does. He falls into the bathtub on into the camera. And then there are these black and white sparks as he dies, and that wakes him up during the storm. Damn. Fucking crazy. Yeah, right? Yeah, the fact that they thought this was like, oh, yeah, kids will, <laughs> kids will eat this shit up. <laughs> it's nuts. I mean, in a way, it, it harkens back to classic Disney nightmare stuff. Yeah. Well, it reminds me a little bit more of Don Bluth. Somewhat, but even so, if you go back to like Snow White and Pinocchio and Fantasia, there is stuff in there that can never be done for for modern children's, you know, popular entertainment. Yeah. Oh, the Pinocchio body horror donkey transformation sequences. Yeah. Again, one of those things is like forever seared in childhood brains. Yeah. But but so, yes, the storm happens. They uh, I think the their their battery that they're using to keep themselves charged is going to go out. So the lamp sacrifices himself to get a lightning strike to recharge the battery. Yeah. We think the lamp is dead. Yeah. The blanket gets stuck in a tree and it's like, help get me down. And I was just like, leave it, go <laughs> fuck the blanket. Um, but the lamp, you know, the, the, the lamp does not die. They eventually fall into quicksand or some kind of <laughs> pit like that. Where sort of like muck pit, whatever. Again, another like they're all dying sequence. Yeah, there's so many like they're all going to We think they fall off a waterfall at one point. They, there's these nightmare dreams about them dying. So much death, this idea that they are going to die because of their obsolescence, which we'll get to. Um, but they get stuck in this muck pit. And just before they die, uh, radio starts playing... <laughs> Al Jolson for some reason. Mammy. Gee, Jesus yes. Christ. Okay. Let me break out the blackface tunes. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I don't think he says Mammy. I think he's like nanny. They, they replace some. He's not saying Mammy. Um, 
I, I believe. I could be wrong. Um, that could be wishful thinking on my part. Not like kids and whenever the fuck <laughs> this was produced would know that tune. Yes, but uh, before, right before they get sucked into the muck, uh, some big fat guy <laughs> comes by and happens to pull them all out. And he is some kind of like junk shop repair guy who sa- who sells machine parts and he drives an enormous monster truck. All these weird details like and this is something that we said about the peanut butter solution too, where it's like it's all these little weird choices. Yeah, yeah. They stack up to to make a pretty fucking strange movie in total. But uh, and, and this is very reminiscent of what goes on in, in, in Toy Story throughout the, the first, you know, actually throughout all of toy story, like even toy story four kind of touches on this sort of stuff, like the creepy toy shop. Mm. Um, they, they take him back to his like appliance dungeon, you know, um, where, where he is, he is presented as basically from the appliances perspective as like this mad scientist, Dr. Frankenstein thing who is, he's created mishmash contraptions out of all these different appliances. Like there's one that's like doing a Joan Rivers impersonation. And it's like, I'm a lamp, a shaver and a something. Oh, I'm a mishmash. Um, and in this is, is a, our next song, which uh, I believe is called B movie show. And this should be my favorite song because it's just a bunch of horror movie references. And, and Phil Hartman shows up as a ceiling lamp. That's doing a Peter Laurie impersonation. Well, they put the classic cartoon parody, you know, caricature Peter Laurie face on it with the big oh, yeah. teeth and all that kind of shit. I don't know why this movie is intent on doing this kind of stuff. It really just seems like the animators were in it to please themselves on this one, which I'm just kind of like, yeah, okay, for good for you. But, um, <laughs> Why, why are you making this like big, uh, it's almost like a Rocky horror or like, like I said, it's like a Phantom of the Paradise song, um, in the middle of this movie that has nothing to do with anything else. Well, this has always been kind of my centerpiece argument for the Brave Little Toaster's horror is like having this song, which is drop, you know, dropping us. like, I remember Frankenstein sent shivers up my spine. Um, you know, they name drop Vincent Price in the lyrics and everything. This has always been the centerpiece of my argument for it is horror. It's like, oh, the creators, the writers, the animators are so clearly tapping into that, not just for this one musical sequence, but overall for a lot of the the, the tone and the mood of this movie. It is trying to scare kids. Yeah, for sure. It's to the point where the the characters themselves, like the the central ensemble, realizes they themselves will have to resort to horror to get out of the situation. So they they decide to play a game of let's scare the appliance junk guy to death. <laughs> yes, they they create a ghost kind of setup with the vacuum and blanket and toaster and spook him, and this causes his dog to run out of the store and drive away in the monster truck. That because new pieces of cartoon logic presented to us every minute in this movie. Yes. Um, but dog, after this, dog they, can drive monster truck. Okay. They, they are able to escape and uh, eventually do get to the city. And this is when we find out that not only has their master been gone, he's been gone for what might be a decade. Yeah. Yeah. He is. Uh, uh, when we find him preparing to move away to a dormitory, and he decides with this this sort of young lady friend that he's hanging out with, he's like, okay, I'm going to drive out to the old cabin that I haven't been to in God knows how long. They're getting ready to sell it. He's like, I'm going to pick up those old appliances that I had there and I'll use those in my dorm. And so the, like ships passing in the night, our, our hero appliances and their, uh, uh, their coveted master uh, have missed one another. And it's like, oh, no. Classic comedy of errors type writing. Mm-hmm. Like they, I think they, they literally pass each other on the road. Yeah. So that's all fine. But the, the reveal that these appliances have been keeping up their routine for like nearly a decade while this kid was away and pining for this kid like they have suddenly makes them way creepier. And like their psychology, particularly the one with the fucking blanket, uh, and, and the toaster as well. Cause the toaster fantasizes about having the master again, you know, it, it makes their psychology way, way creepier. Like how clingy and codependent are your appliances? Well, I mean, they all have moments. I remember the, the lamp has a flashback where he talks about his bulb burning out and he thought, this is it. I'm, I'm dead. I've become useless. The master's going to kill me. Right. And he's like, no, he just put a new light bulb in and I felt that warm glow as he describes it. And this is where kind of the theme of the movie comes around. And it's a super Disney theme is 
the value that you put on on nostalgia and particularly nostalgia directed towards things right and it's a big decision in this movie that they didn't decide to use any recognizable brands mm-hmm. you know none of the designs are are you know based on any one particular brand of appliance they would later get to that with toy story like the same idea in toy story as you know yes. they were they were using recognizable toy brands um, and that got even more and more prominent as the Toy Story movies went on, you know, with Barbie and so on and so forth. Mm. But um, yeah, the the you know the, you'd think that you know, hey, reuse your old appliances would be a you know, a, there's like an eco thing that they could do with that, like hey, re, you know, recycle, you know, don't send your shit to the junkyard and to the landfill, recycle, bring those things with you, reuse them. You know, th- there could be like a an ecological message with that, but they they don't ever broach that. Instead. The ultimate moral message of the film is sacrifice yourself for the master. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to we're, we're almost there because when they accidentally pass each other and the appliances get to the master's apartment, they are presented with what what is the the master's mom. He's still been living with his mom, like all of her fancier new modern appliances. And before the toaster and gang show up, the the modern appliances here like hey he's going to get all this old junk that he's taking to the dorm instead of us so when the appliances show up the modern appliances plan to all right we're gonna you know knock these guys off essentially um so they get a song this is our third song which is called cutting edge this is my least favorite song in the movie it's not a bad song it's just the way that it's recorded it's really difficult to understand the lyrics it is. And I mean, this has to do with Van Dyke Parks' approach to this, where it's like, I'm going to make something a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more grown up, a little bit different than you would expect in your typical sort of kids movie. Whereas, you know, you listen to the kind of songs that like Alan Menken and Tim Rice were composing for Disney movies at the time. You know, look at Aladdin, you know, a whole new world. Sure, every, I mean, well, every syllable is like perfectly pronounced. Every kid knows what's being said. Yes. I mean, the, those, the, you know, the, the Howard Ashman stuff. And, and it was all about crisp, deliberate, emotional messaging in the songs. Yeah. Whereas the stuff that Van Dyke Parks does for here, it's it's they're all mood pieces. Yeah, that's true. Um, and this one, since it's all about modern appliances, it's all, you know, very synth stuff and it sounds very of its like of the eighties kind of funky. It's got a little bit of Peter Gabriel, a little bit of Prince. Yeah. A little Herbie Hancock. Sure. Um, and, and, and it's not, again, it's not a bad song, but I think the way that it's recorded, they wanted to do this kind of, you know, digitized riff on the vocals because it's supposed to be coming, you know, from like a a, a, a desktop computer and mm-hmm. all of this kind of stuff. It's like, oh, it, 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 <laughs> it reminded me little... of the computer from Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. I sent you. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you sent me that from Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared for And I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Um, but yes, then eventually the the modern appliances are able to kick the toaster and gang into a dumpster outside the apartment window and they are taken off to the junkyard. And this is where for my entire life, it's like, yeah, I remember the nightmare clown. Yeah. I remembered the, the B movie show, you know, with all these mutilated appliances and stuff. All of that was always scary to me. Like uh, as, as all the other stuff we mentioned, this section of the movie was the one where as a kid, I'm like, something's going on here that I'm, I'm, I know I'm supposed to feel like really heavy and sad about because the appliances are at the junkyard. As far as they think the master doesn't want them anymore, that they are worthless, which leads to the song worthless in which a series of cars in this junkyard sing about their past as they are taken by a giant of course, anthropomorphized magnet mm. to an anthropomorphized crusher and killed. Yeah. I mean, like chewed up into little cubes. I mean, all this is, you know, obviously incredibly nightmarish. I feel like at this point, though, that my my big problem with the movie is kind of exemplified because this could have been played up stylistically to be a lot more engaging. Um, I think there is a huge section of the film kind of starting right right after they get um 
out of the the horror section, like uh, uh, the the crazy appliance dungeon. After they get out of that, the movie takes a big pacing dump, and it's at this point like I was I was really bored. I think the part of the problem is that the master has not been in the movie at all until the third act. Then all of a sudden he becomes a perspective protagonist character. Yeah, and in a very strange scene, he actually goes back out to the cottage. Uh, where he sees that it's kind of fallen into disarray because all the appliances have left. And he fixes the air conditioner that got all crazy in the first act. And it wakes up after he leaves the room and starts crying in relief because this angelic God being the master has repaired him. Has resurrected him. Yeah. Has literally brought him back to life. That air conditioner was dead. Uh huh. The, this is the kind of weird, twisted stuff that's going on in this movie. The, uh, the reverence that these appliances have for the master is, I think, in retrospect, the most creepy thing to me. I mean, there are like outright nightmarish horror moments with the clown and stuff like that that are just like, you know, images that are seared upon my brain. But psychologically, the the codependence and the and the 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 psychological need for the love of the master to, to me is just like really gross. <laughs> well, I I think there's certainly a uh, and I can't speak to the source material from Thomas Dish and what this kind of act. I definitely think there's a Judeo Christian read of this where you know the master is God or Jesus, and you know he is he has left your light. And you need to find him again because the 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 appliance characters, they aren't really I think this might be a larger problem with viewing this movie as an adult is like you're saying their motivations are obvious. We you know find master, but they're never treated as like audience proxies in terms of their emotions. They their their emotions are very different um, because they're not human. And as much as they try to humanize their their plight in certain ways, it never really clicks. And then when we get the human character of the master, he is just this kind of guy who wants his old stuff and also is a God being as far as the appliances are concerned. He is God. Like, yeah, he the master can do no wrong. Um, like after all these years of neglect, quote unquote, like they're still like, Oh, I want him back. I want him back so bad. You know, and this blanket particularly is just so fucking creepy. Well, so, so, so this sequence with, with, uh, worthless, the song, my big problem is that it continually cuts back and forth from the song and what's happening in the junkyard with the master and his girlfriend or, or friend that is a girl, debating about like, yo, you know, what can we do? Maybe we should go somewhere and try and buy some old junk. And the television set is apparently an old appliance that made its way out of the cottage. Right. He's an, he's allied with the, the old appliance gang. Yes. So apparently he can appear as this human in the television set who is trying to coax the master into going to the the junkyard disposal by making up this all this crazy advertising and stuff. It's like go to Crazy Eddie's crazy junkyard appliances for cheap or whatever. He yeah, says. yeah. He's like he's like uh, Crazy Eddie's junkyard. He's like total bargain madness. <laughs> um, which eventually that does work, and the master goes off to the junkyard. But the actual worthless sequence where all these cars, it's just a montage of them being murdered. And they are just talking about their past, about like, you know, oh, I, I went to all these places and now I'm worthless. Um, there isn't a chorus in Worthless, which which is, I think, really interesting. Yeah, it's all just verses from different perspectives. Yes. And you and you just you get things like a hearse. A hearse gets destroyed and has lyrics like I took a man to a graveyard. I beg your pardon. It's quite hard enough just living with the stuff I have learned. Boom crushed like <laughs> and then maybe 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 the one that really really gets me is this tiny car and it says i worked on a reservation who would believe they would love me and leave me on a bus back to old santa fe once in an indian nation i took the kids on the skids where the hopi was happy till i heard him say you're worthless it's like this is not meant for kids yeah this this isn't music for little ears um, it's basically at this point, the makers of the film kind of making a movie for themselves. And I think this is what has allowed little toaster to be as weird a movie as it is. Uh, I think my, my overall impression of the film now, 
uh, is that this is just an exceedingly weird movie, but not an especially good one. Um, the ending is kind of, you know, what we're coming to, it's a little unearned. Somewhat. I mean, there, there is definitely, I think because the toaster has this nightmare about the master and, and is terrified of the, it's the smoke coming out of him that hurts the master. Like it's his fault. Yeah. Um, and, and this terror that it will be because of the toaster that the master could potentially get hurt in this junkyard sequence when this giant magnet, which is also inc- another terrifying aspect of the movie um, as it's hunting them around. Unfortunately, from a writing perspective, this is not written well in which the magnet gets the appliances, puts them on the uh, the the conveyor belt to the crusher they get off somehow the magnet chases them again puts it back on they get off somehow the magnet it's it's exceedingly repetitive um and just is not mined well for good drama but the the master shows up he eventually sees his old appliances on the conveyor belt and tries to take them off but the magnet for whatever motivation reasons it has must kill these things and sucks them back up and in doing so gets the master as well. And he gets put on the conveyor belt and is stuck on under this junk. He is headed towards the crusher. It is exceedingly nightmarish as his hand is about to be crushed. The toaster is on top of a pile of junked old cars and stuff. And he is looking down and in the reflection of his face, he sees the gears of the crusher and the master about to go into it. And then he dives off into the gears and they just destroy him. My life for the master. Yes. My ah! life for you. And, and you, you say it's unearned. I'm, I, I, I don't totally disagree, but I think clearly from everything we said, like the devotion to this God being the master is so prevalent that like he, he's a character without fault. It, uh, yeah. He is without fault. Uh, we do see him like as an adult and, you know, he's, he seems pretty normal. Like he has kind of an engineering knack, obviously, because he can repair a window shaker, uh, you know, uh, AC unit. But yeah, uh, the the psychology of all these characters and what they wish to accomplish and why and the kind of moral message that comes along the way is, is kind of uh, lost uh, and really doesn't get a whole lot of focus. And really, I think the the like I said, the the overwhelming feeling I get about this is boy this is fucking weird and and there are really no uh huge consequences for the toaster having given up its quote-unquote life like the 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 master just you know repairs it after Mm -hmm. being mangled utterly mangled between the gears of a you know a car they they go back they go back to that shot of the toaster getting crushed a lot like (laughs) it it continually is just getting turned into silly putty he got fucked Um, up yes but but yes eventually the master is saved uh he gets his appliances back fixes them they're put in the car to go to college with him and they all have a good laugh in the trunk and that's it like that's the end so i always loved this movie as a kid you know because you're a kid you you watch what you have and you love it because you don't know any better but i i still have an affection for this movie like there there is a deep-seated nostalgia that that I will never be able to dig out in regards to this movie. But upon this watch, I, I see a lot of the flaws of it. At the same time, and especially in regards to Childhood Nightmares Month, I think The Brave Little Toaster is a must-see movie. I don't know. I think there are sequences from it that are must-see sequences. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to watch this film in full again. But there are certain sequences from it that I know I will reference and that I know I will watch again because they are so singular. You know, I haven't seen sequences like that clown nightmare and in, in much other stuff. Like it, it made a hell of an impression. And not just because you and I were young when we first saw it. I mean, it still makes an impression today. It's effective horror. And I, Incredibly, and I think, yeah. I, th- I think the horror of the brave little toaster across the board is effective. I, I think in in regards to that being a mission statement, which I think it is a mission statement of the movie, I think it's a big success. It's way more effective early on in the film than it is in the second half. Maybe. I I, I, I still feel that it's effective enough, but I see your criticisms about the narrative pacing and, and the the emotional kind of weight of what's going on as far as through, you know, character perspective and stuff. I see all that. And that's why I say that this, the movie ends up feeling more like a series of vignettes than a 
truly cohesive narrative with very specific arcs. Yeah, it, they call the movie the Brave Little Toaster, but the toaster itself doesn't even really act as a protagonist at all. For a lot of the movie, it's it's an ensemble. Yeah, it's an it's an ensemble piece until the toaster decides to mangle itself to save the master. But t- talking about this in in the childhood nightmares theme. It's interesting because, uh, you know, quality wise, I think we're saying a lot of what we said with peanut butter solution, where it's like the movie is is okay ish, but the things that stick out really stick out. And the themes that we picked up on that movie, the Brave Little Toaster is something a little more interesting because the the theming isn't really focused from a child perspective. I guess there's an argument to be made that obviously the blanket is being performed as, as a child. Um these appliances don't act like the the closest one that acts like some kind of recognizable adult figure, at least as it would appear to kids is the vacuum Kirby. Right. It's the, the old sort of, it's the old man character. Uh, he gets, he gets probably one of my favorite lines in the movie. They go after, they go through that like patch of thistles. He's, my bag's all full of thistles and sticks. <laughs> and he is voiced wonderfully by Thurl Ravenscroft. One of the great voices of, 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 of the time um, who most people will know for singing the Grinch, the original Grinch song. And he's lead vocals on the uh, haunted mansion song, grim grinning ghosts. That's right. But yeah, I, 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 childhood nightmares. It's interesting because even though there is a literal nightmare sequence in this movie, the fears aren't really ones about childhood Um, in a way. They're more about, these appliances feeling responsible for their duty to the master and also feel that and also that the appliances have outlived their function and their worth, which is a very adult fear Yes, because kids don't fear that if kids don't feel like they have a, a certain functional role in the way that adults do. So this is a, a fear of like being put out to pasture, uh, a fear of obsolescence, um, which are all very grown up fears. Yes. And that, that makes it, kind of strange and impenetrable to children, which only increases the sort of nightmarish feel. And, you know, the, the inclusion of certain nightmarish elements would not be out of the question in, you know, like we did the black cauldron, for instance, the Disney movie, the black cauldron, which has some very nightmarish imagery in it, but that's a high fantasy story. You know, it's goblins and orcs and dragons and that kind of stuff. And so that sort of imagery doesn't feel as out of place in a high fantasy setting, but because this is like an exceedingly mundane setting, it feels like when this nightmare shit peeks in, it's like something from another dimension. Yeah. And, and as far as, like you say, I don't think there's ch- like in peanut butter solution, there were childhood fears that I think were being utilized for, for theme in that movie. Oh yeah. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if we were going to have a childhood fear perspective, it would be from the master, even though he's going away to college, he basically acts like a kid. Um, he, he's a, he's not old enough to where I think a, a, a child viewer would feel like he's a big, like he's an adult capital a, um, he's recognizable enough because they've seen him as a younger kid. And he's like, you know, it's like, yeah, he's, he could be my older brother or something like that. Yeah, um, maybe. And, and so his perspective, again, it, it comes around to me like, no, I'm nostalgic for these specific things. And the fear, like the fear when they're gone from the cabin, this fear that, you know, these things that I valued as a kid are lost to me. And then when I read, you know, find them again, my life is complete. This all actually really tracks with kind of Disney messaging. Right. It's about, um, you know, the, the monetization of your childhood experiences and being able to sell your experiences to you in a package. And in this case, the package is the appliance. So with the appliance comes this whole wealth of experiences that you had as a child. And here putting the perspective in the appliances is, is kind of, you know, it's kind of twisted. Um, but really what it's, it's doing is it's saying like, Oh, your, your, your memories and your nostalgia and your warm fuzzies exist as a product that we can sell to you. Yes. As a physical thing that you can buy, um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which again, it's like for not being a directly Disney movie, that's an extremely on brand message yeah for Disney. Yeah, the fact that it's about like material products you know is, is, there's a definitely consumerist element to this yeah but uh, uh you know kind of summing it all up i do i i do still have a fondness for this movie if just for it's very rare to see this kind of nightmarish approach to a lot of 
a lot of sequences in the movie that you just don't see in modern animation from this era or forward. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot about this movie I admire still to this day, but as a whole, I don't think I can really recommend it, you know, to certainly not to adults. I mean, maybe kids will like it because, well, you know, kids have broad tastes in in a lot of things. So I, I think, I think this is a movie considering that I saw it so young. I think this is a good way to gauge your kids kind of, limitations with horror imagery <laughs> if that's something you want to do as a parent <laughs> well you know i mean as as a parent you kind of you think about the content that your kids are going to be imbibing especially when they're very young and you can always be there for context and i think the brave little toaster is a good movie to kind of get it's like if this really freaks them out then you know maybe they're you know a little too sensitive for this stuff but also there's shit in this stuff that freaks out adults still. So sure. Well, you can talk about being ob- obsolete and, you know, being crushed by the machine of <laughs> capitalism. The clown shit is still freaky. I'm not terribly afraid of clowns, but like that sequence is really freaky. Sure. The, 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 the concept alone is freaky, but when he leans in and the entire frame is his face in close up and he says, run and the smoke comes out it's like that, that would not be out of place in Stephen King's it. Sure. Um, so I think this is a movie that, again, like the peanut butter solution, the memorable parts of it are so memorable. And, and I think I, I can say that even discounting my own deeply ingrained nostalgia about it. I think this that stuff holds up. But it, I will agree that as a, the, the bigger picture, the Brave Little Toaster is is pretty shaky. But if if it's something that you kind of want to see, you know, where where your kids what your kids can handle uh, in terms of material that is still suitable enough for them. Uh, I think the Brave Little Toaster is worth a recommend. But let's head over to the shelf where we pick some movies that might act as good pairings or substitutes for our main topic. And as always, we encourage you loyal listeners to go to genrevision.com comment on the post uh, for this episode with your own shelf picks and we'll feature them in next week's episode. Travis, what are you pulling off the shelf for the brave little toaster? Uh, This is a quick and simple recommendation, but if you were looking for a movie that uh, does a better job as far as writing its um, moral message into the, the fabric of the film and also does a better job with animation and character design, uh, but also kind of has that that freaky legacy of being a movie that, that just, um, you know, was maybe a little bit too grown up for the audience it, it wanted to appeal to. Uh, I think you should watch The Last Unicorn. We have reviewed this for the show. Uh, I urge you to go back and listen to our episode on it. But uh, I, it's a pretty good flick from what I remember. Yeah, we liked it. And that, that Rankin Bass stuff, like The Hobbit and everything, I think that's another... Or whenever you get outside the the direct purview of Disney, you use when there's animation for kids, you usually get stuff that that pushes the envelope in certain ways. Yeah, and, and this had a, a Japanese animation team behind it, mm, and um, yeah. the the attention to certain things in in Japanese animation. You know, with this not being an anime, um, I think the the kind of affection for the animated format is apparent. Uh, in in Last Unicorn, um, it's it's a, a really cool flick. Uh, I, I remember a lot about it. I believe some of those animators would go on to be part of Studio Ghibli. Yes, they did. Uh, speaking of which, I did watch um, Kiki's Delivery Service for the first time the other week. But I'll, I'll talk about that on um, monthly currently consuming at the end of uh, August. Which you can listen to on Patreon at patreon.com slash genre vision plugged. Yep. So for my shelf pick, we, we continually mentioned them. And I think it's kind of necessary as a pairing to the brave little toaster is the the toy story films particularly the first three four wasn't bad but it really has not stuck with me um in terms of a narrative i think there's great filmmaking stuff like you shared that uh that nerd writer thing about the yeah the, the cinematography camera yeah yeah the cinematography of that it's wonderful i liked toy story for a, a great deal actually i thought it was pretty damn good i didn't dislike it but it just hasn't stuck with me especially because three felt like deliberately final in a way. Yeah. Three was a great ending. Yes. And and three has a moment where the characters are being headed towards a furnace to die. But of course, you know, (laughs) um, and and that's the thing is the first, there is so much of the first three toy story movies in the brave little toaster story beats, like um, 
a, a number of different things. And I, and I can't speak to the uh, DTV sequels to Brave Little Toaster, which are Brave Little Toaster to the Rescue and Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars. I've never seen a frame from them. Um, so I can't speak to if there's any more Toy Story stuff in there. But I think considering the people that are involved in Brave Little Toaster would go on to be a part of Pixar, Toy Story feels like a, a, a second attempt at like doing a, a, a similar story um, that they got m- much more right when they when they hit on the Toy Story stuff. Um, it has a lot of the same themes, you know, about like, you know, value your nostalgia in this case, instead of appliances, because that's a weird thing to value. Like as a kid, like, mm. oh, man, like my toaster. Um, but toys make much more sense to to milk that thematically. Yes, for sure. And, and of course, the Toy Story movies are great, so I don't need to sing their praises any more than they already have. But they feel kind of like the obvious pairing to, to have with this kind of movie, considering the um, the lineage in, uh, involved with uh, people who worked on it. Uh, we are going to turn things over to the listener's shelf picks uh, for last week's episode on the peanut butter solution. Pale Fire recommended two films, Kid Co. and The Boy Who Could Fly. Mr. Milksteak went with The Children from 1980. T-Bones McRoanoke chose the Disney film Watcher in the Woods, which we contemplated doing for this month, but we wanted to do some other non-Disney stuff because there's a lot of Disney in this month. Uh, Hob went with the early comics of Chester Brown collected in The Little Man and I Never Liked You. Eric Fuchs went with the good old standard Troll 2. Gotta see Troll 2. Ryan Covey went with Making Contact, which is also known as Joey, which is Roland Emmerich's debut film and a very weird one. Neil Tazad went with Degrassi because the actor who plays Connie is apparently in a number of different incarnations of Degrassi. And Steven Espella went with Mr. Boogity, which is, I believe, a Disney television movie. Uh, And there's one more shelf pick, but we're going to get to that a little bit later. As always, thank you, everybody, for these shelf picks. Amazing that this has taken off the way it has, and we love seeing them every week. Let's do some currently consuming. Travis, what's been on your plate? Everybody's talking about this new thing called Host uh, from Shudder. And Host is a, it's it's an hour long movie. So technically it's a short film, but eh, you know, it's all under the umbrella of content these days anyway. Um, Anyway, you can get it on Shudder. It's a Shudder exclusive. And the gimmick here is that it is kind of a found footage horror movie, but in reality it's a, uh, an hour long uh zoom conference that plays out in real time where it's like six young women who decide to have a seance over zoom one night and they all get attacked by a demon it's basically paranormal activity zoom edition and it's fine it's been getting a lot of great reviews and um really what those reviews say to me is hey we actually really think the original paranormal activity was on some good shit and I, I tend to agree with them. I will go to bat for the first paranormal activity mm-hmm. because host is basically the first paranormal activity with a, you know, again, a really strong commitment to its whole technological angle. It basically looks uh, almost indistinguishable from a real zoom conference. And um, it's, it's, it's basically just a, a zoom movie where a bunch of people get attacked and killed by a demon. It's fine. Well, I, I I've not seen the movie, but, but my my kind of approach to it was like every generation is going to have kind of their quote found footage or whatever, you know, kind of label you want to put on it. And it's because it captures something about the technology and the perspective of the time for Blair Witch. I think it really caught that, you know, Gen X cinema verite movement and everything that was going on. And the idea that like, hey, we could go out in the woods with our camcorder that our parents bought us and do this. Um, Same thing with paranormal activity where it became about like, oh, yeah, like home security systems and setting up stuff like this is a that is a thing that became more more and more common and probably more common shortly after paranormal activity. Um, And because we've seen things like this, there there have been movies that have done this that haven't hit as big, probably just for distribution reasons uh, like open windows uh, a one that did get theatrical and did okay was like unfriended. Yeah, um, there was the den which I reviewed. I think for Chud, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I mean that, that's uh, and then um, what 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 was the 
John Cho. Was it called Searching? I believe so. And that was yes. like a that was like a whole digital desktop experience movie. Yes, that was a th- and and it was and it wasn't supernatural, but it was a thriller and all this kind of stuff. And and it got some you know fair amount of critical praise. Yes, I I saw it and I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, same here. And, and Host has definitely caught the hey now that we're all having to. <laughs> you know, work with Zoom conferences and video conferencing and all of this kind of stuff that, you know, this movie was shot during quarantine. It was shot through, you know, this kind of, uh, this kind of technology. So it feels very of its time and good, you know, good that that's by no means a a, a negative. It's, it's It's capturing a moment and it's doing a pretty good job. And then I think some people just find that concept grading and I totally get that. Like some people don't want to see, you know, um, you know, the zoom interface at all. Like, and the, the whole reason that it's under an hour is like, nobody wants to be on a fucking zoom call for over an hour. Sure. And I know this because like I'm on zoom calls, like all day, some days as part of my job because mm. I, I host uh virtual depositions for lawyers over zoom so they can last hours and hours. So yeah, I, I was sick of zoom. Like there's a moment in the first couple minutes where one of the characters is having an audio issue because she has two devices joined into the zoom conference in the same room. And there's a feedback loop. And I was just like, uh, this is my fucking work day. <laughs> so there's, there's authenticity. It took a great deal of willpower for me not to like stop watching at that point. Cause it was just like, I don't want to deal with this. This is like instant work anxiety. It's, it's a fairly decent flick and it, and at like 56 minutes, it's not wasting your time. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm certainly intrigued by it and I think I'll give it a watch before, before the year's out. But there's, there's nothing in this that you haven't seen in paranormal activity before. So just be, be a, you know, be forewarned. If you don't like what paranormal activity movies do, eh, you shouldn't care about host. Okay. Uh, real quick on my end, two things. Uh, the movie Lake Michigan Monster, which is available on the Arrow channel. Uh, this is, I think it was actually made in like 2018 or, or, or so um, and played some festivals and everything. Uh, if I was going to have a, a poll quote, for the cover of this, I would be, nobody would get this reference, so they'd never quote me, but I would say, it's like The Lighthouse meets Forbidden Zone, which I'm sure nobody, I don't know how many people listening have seen, have seen Forbidden Zone, which is directed by Danny Elfman's brother and was kind of this weird little art collective project film, um, very wacky, very uh, kind of cartoonish, and that's definitely the the vibe that's going on in Lake Michigan Monster. It's got kind of a very kinetic comedic kind of vibe to everything um if that sounds like something you'd want to check out it's available over on arrows video channel uh i think it's like just under an hour 20 so you know pretty short uh and then the other one that i wrote a review for uh which we'll link to in the show notes for this episode is waiting for the barbarians uh this is adapted from a 1980 novel uh, by an author called J.M., I believe it's Coetzee? Sure. Sure. Uh, he. This is his first screenplay, and he's adapting his own novel. This novel is very, very acclaimed. Uh, it's about a fictional empire that looks very much like kind of classic British colonialism. Uh, Mark Rylance plays a magistrate in a small settlement that's on the outskirts of the desert, and things are going along pretty okay. He's uh, Peace is all good. And then an evil colonel played by Johnny Depp shows up and is going to start interrogating and torturing uh, some of the local populace who they call barbarians uh, because they believe that an attack is imminent. Uh, You can go read my review for some of my full full thoughts. Uh, This is a movie that uh, I can't recommend to anybody right now because it's such a bummer Mm. and and the things that it's a bummer about are the things that I'm thinking about when I look out my window. Yeah, no thanks. Yeah, and and it's I mean, granted, this is all done through allegory. Um, you know, it's not directly bringing up specific things, but the the allegory, which has existed, you know, since 1980 when the novel came out, there are things that the 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 director, um, whose name is Ciro. Uh, Guerra, I think. Um, I don't have that pulled up, which I should. Uh, this is his English speaking debut film. Uh, the movie's directed extremely well and, and the production quality is great and everything. But it's very clear that they are, whether this is a, the, the script or the direction choices, that they are hearkening to things that will be 
very, very clear to modern audiences. Like seeing a bunch of non white people locked up in cages uh, from a, a militarized police outfit. Ooh, uh, <laughs> uh, definitely not subtle. Yeah. Evoked some things. I, I think the movie is kind of fatally flawed because it, it plays like a novel um, in that there is not kind of a cinematic pacing because the, the pacing of the actual story, if I kind of meted it out to you would sound like, okay, yeah, things happen at a, at a decent clip, but the actual execution, it makes it feel really languid, hmm. um, which is a bummer. Cause I think the story is actually pretty interesting and it's a, it, uh, the ending apparently has changed from the novel. The The ending of the novel has a little bit more of a, a white savior issue, I think. Okay. Uh, this does not have that. This is a very downbeat ending, I believe. And and it's an ambiguous ending as well. Uh, so it's it's one It's like, yeah, the, the movie's made well. Like, the performances are good. Nobody's capital A acting. Um, Even Johnny Depp? No, he is extremely subtle. Uh, this this is actually one of the better roles I've seen him in in a long time. Color me surprised. Uh, yeah, I mean, he is he is everybody like there is a direction clearly to downplay things and kind of let the words of the characters speak for themselves. Hmm. And and Johnny Depp cuts like a really good, scary fascist character. Huh. Well, um, and I know Pattinson can certainly make some big swings, too. So he he gets the he and Mark Rylance basically each get one moment where they kind of basically get to yell for like two lines. That's about as <laughs> I've abandoned my child. Yes, that that's about as big as the movie ever gets. Otherwise, I think a lot of people will view this as slow. Um and like quote nothing is happening. Uh which I don't I don't believe is the case. But again, it's just so hard to recommend because it's just so it's so downbeat and really bummed me out. But if, if, if that's something that you feel that you can handle and you might be interested in the, uh, in it, you can go read my review for the more particulars. So waiting for the barbarians. Uh, now, now we get to close things out with our comment of the week and our comment of the week is another shelf pick. This is from JT who, this is one of the reasons I love genre vision. And I love our loyal listeners is that we get to discover movies as well. Uh, that's part of this whole kind of movie club thing we've got going here. And JT has his shelf pick for the peanut butter solution. Talked about a movie from, I believe 1983 called Millie Willie, also known as something special in which a young girl played by Pamela Adlon, who is a tomboy and, and doesn't really go for girly things, makes a wish on an eclipse and her deepest, darkest wish is that she could be a boy. So the next morning, she wakes up with a penis. I mean, like not just like in her hand. I mean, like she, no, she, she her genitalia her. is now male genitalia. Yes, and she, uh, her father, played by John Glover, uh, embraces this idea and is going to, you know, teach Millie, who is now going as Willie, to to be a man and whatever that means. Uh, I watched the trailer for this because again, I, well, it, the, the process was JT commented about it. I was like, I, this has never been on my radar. I've never heard of this. Looked at the poster. The poster sent me rolling. It's a phenomenal. You got to see the one that for the poster, uh, for it under the Millie Willie title. Um, and then I watched the trailer and the trailer is just nuts. It's things that like. I, I know Pamela Adlon and John Glover and anybody else who's in, involved in this movie prays that it never gets dug up <laughs> Be, because it is just the most horrifically uncool shit in this trailer. I can't believe it, but, but I'm fascinated now. Like we, this may make its way onto the show at some point um, because I'm just deeply curious about it. Uh, so thank you, JT for turning us on to Millie Willie. Uh, but like I say, that's part of why we love genre vision. We get to discover new things as well with, with, with y'all. So thank you so much to our loyal listeners for doing that. And next week we'll continue childhood nightmares month with, I think a movie that a lot of people had nightmares from, from their childhood, which is return to Oz. So we hope you'll be back next week when we can check out that absolute, uh, traumatizing piece of children's fiction. As always, we want to thank you so much for listening. I'm Drew Deach. I'm Travis Newton. 
and we'll see you next week right here on Genre Vision. <laughs> <laughs>